What's going on guys, Andrew of Newmark Gaming back here today, and today we're going to be talking about some Yu-Gi-Oh! Reigns episode 71. Now with this episode I was very pleasantly surprised for the second episode in a row just by how much we had to talk about, how much plot we got, and I love the fact that they took some time to take a break from the dueling and just have an episode developing the plot. That for me is a lot of times where this show shines, especially considering I feel like its duels for the most part have been relatively lackluster. So let's go ahead and jump right into this. Now I want to start off by saying uh, I called about 60% of it and that one of our big things revealed to us in this episode was that lightning did indeed destroy the Cyverse world. Now that was one of my theories. I had believed that, you know, maybe lightning set it up to make it seem like the humans attacked it just to be able to trigger the Ignises into being like, well, hey, if they're attacking us and they're our enemy, that way he could kind of then and puppet the Ignises to want to destroy humanity along with him, or at the very least conquer humanity, I guess, is more so what his goals are. But it didn't go exactly like that. It was more so he just wanted to spark the conflict. He wasn't necessarily spinning it into negative propaganda against humanity, more so just create a need for something to change amongst, amongst the Ignises, and he seemed to hope that that would be enough to push them to be able to follow him and follow his leadership in trying to overcome humanity. Now, with that being said, we did also find out where the kind of political factions, if you will, amongst the six AIs were before Cyrus World got destroyed. We can pretty much assume, based on what we've seen, that Windy and Lightning stood on the side of, hey, coexistence with humanity, that's not going to work out. We already had this Dr. Kogami guy try to eliminate us once. If we just let them keep doing as they do, what's saying another one won't come and do that very shortly here. Then we also had, we find out, it was Aqua and Flame who were very much pro-coexistence with humans. And based off that, we can probably assume that I and Earth fell somewhere in the middle. So with all that, keeping all that in mind, they were on opposite sides of the political spectrum in the Cyverse world. And the fact that we've seen, you know, Lightning is outright declaring Flame and I his enemies now, more or less. And he's basically declaring war on them. He speaks to the fact that they're able to sympathize with humanity as being a negative glitch in their system, a bad error code in their DNA, is, I think is the analogy that he made. If we're keeping all those perspectives in mind, I'm kind of scared for Aqua's sake that maybe Lightning killed her at the beginning of all of this plot because she seemed to have a good amount of sway over um, I and Earth respectively. They both seemed to have some kind of feelings towards her. Earth outright said that he would take whatever side Aqua was on. Lightning was aware Aqua was siding with coexistence with humans. So then suddenly he could very easily find himself in a position where he's trying to wage this war on humanity and his only ally is going to be windy as opposed to having you know all the AIs united under one flag which is going to make his job very difficult because then not only is he fighting humanity he's fighting four of his you know closest other coexistent I don't know if he would consider them friends acquaintances if you will because he seems kind of split on that but regardless you got to figure I and earth most likely would have ended up siding with aqua so maybe he thinks Rather than losing all of them, maybe uh, Aqua just kind of disappears. So there's some ambiguity as to where she would stand on all of this, and maybe I can, you know, sway them to come over and help me fight because I'm going to be fighting the odds anyway, given how, given how outnumbered I am. So keeping all that in mind, it's very cynical, and Lightning is coming across to me as a very by-the-numbers antagonist in that he doesn't necessarily have a motivation that's very driven by emotion. It makes him somewhat difficult to relate to at times, but more so it's kind of, here's my objective, whatever I possibly can do that will increase the probability of making that objective occur is something that I am willing to do. And that makes him all the more terrifying too, because then it's like, there's you know there's no ethological bounds or moral boundaries holding him back he will do whatever proves necessary in order for to him, him to achieve his ends and in some ways i think that can make for a good antagonist it's hard to say but as we're developing antagonists here another important note that we find out in this episode is that bowman essentially is lightning's not uh, basically his model 3.0 if you will himself being the first then you've got um Har Haruto um, being the second one and now Bowman being the third of creating the ultimate form of AI which seems to be in his mind some hybrid of humanity and the Ignises basically taking on the Ignises thought train and Bowman essentially acting to be a much more rapidly evolving form of humans because of his programming and such that will eventually go on to replace humanity. So part of me is based on all of that, let's start with the fact that like why Lightning would want to do this. First off, he acknowledges himself that this is flawed. He doesn't like want to accept that or I'm sorry, he doesn't like that and doesn't believe he's the best successor necessarily. At least that's the way Bowman's describing it to us. 
And secondly, this could very much in his mind be him carrying out the younger Dr. Kogami that was inspired to create the Agnuses in the first place's dream, in that he is creating a version of humanity, very much powered by something similar to the Agnuses, but in like taking on a physical appearance and form and some of the mindsets and adaptability that humanity has and kind of merging them into one creature and specimen that I, I though I think his motives are somewhat twisted that could serve as a successor now where the motives I think spun off from Kogami some is he does seem to intend to have Bowman rule over humanity now moving along with that Bowman also seems to have a couple steps beyond AI's processing in some ways, he acknowledges humans as being very creative, clever, intuitive, being able to constantly grow, and that he has a lot of respect for those like Playmaker, who are always learning, who are always kind of challenging themselves to grow, who are always willing to tackle something new and adapt to their environment around them. But he also states how coexistence still doesn't seem to be an option. So Bowman's perspective on things as we seem to as we get a chance to watch that unravel is something that I'm very curious to see. What exactly does he have in mind? Because he seems to make it evident that that although he is on the same side as lightning and although lightning created him he is acting independently of lightning because he admits okay playmaker you defeat me in a duel and you prove that i am not better than you and i will totally back off and you will have a chance against lightning to fight him as you will and that's not the type of thing i think lightning would imagine once more he seems to be a very by the numbers antagonist and i think he would want to pour everything into making sure his goals are achieved including keeping bowman going against playmaker now keeping all that in mind Bowman seems extremely confident, and we can assume based off the duels we've seen so far, he's dueled Playmaker twice, and on the first time, he basically got the floor totally swept with him. The second time around, he was really shaking Playmaker up, and based off that little preview we got towards the end of this episode, it seems like Playmaker's going to be really backed into a corner. The next episode title was something along the lines of Absolute Perfection, so it seems like we're going to be dealing, watching... Bowman, based off the uh, little subtitles we got too, essentially form what should be on paper a perfect strategy to overcome Playmaker. So then the question becomes, what wins out? Plot armor or perfect dueling skills? It's very, very difficult to ba balance in an anime like this. I mean, we also, we also know that Playmaker hasn't lost a duel yet. He's proven himself to be able to overcome the odds time and time again. So this will be an interesting one. And I really do believe at this point in the show, given how Yu-Gi-Oh! shows now are lasting about 148 episodes, that if we're going to see Playmaker lose at all, this is going to be where we're going to see it happen. I think we're going to be really pushing the boundaries if it drags on any longer without him losing. I think it would be almost pretty safe to assume that he probably won't lose if he doesn't lose here or within the next 10 episodes or so. Regardless, this is probably the duel I've been the most excited for in a long time. I was really hyped to be able to see Revolver used Synchro Summoning, but the duel on the whole I didn't really care so much about is seeing a new summoning mechanic come back. And before this, the last time I can think about myself actually getting really hyped about one of the duels I knew was coming up was probably uh, Playmaker versus Revolver Round 2. And a lot of that was because I was hoping it would happen in real life rather than Link Brains. But at the same time, it was still a decent duel. This one's nonetheless got me very hyped up just to see how it ends up going i really am curious to see playmaker legitimately backed into a corner where he can't do anything i think it would be a great opportunity for his character to develop uh bowman also mentions whoever wins the duel gets i as well as himself so we'll develop a little bit on that part in the, or the second half of that in a second but if playmaker is to lose i at this point that would just make the plot take a very interesting twist. I think it would force Yusaku to grow a lot, do a lot of self-reflection. Um, I think it could be really interesting to watch what happens to Soul Burner from there. And it could just show things taking a very dramatic twist. One of the things Bowman mentions when he talks about being able to be this kind of final evolutionary step for the Ignises is uniting all six Ignises within himself. This almost reminds me a little bit of like the Thanos thing with the Infinity Stones in Avengers Affinity War, where he's trying to collect each of the pieces in order to unleash absolute power. And part of me is almost wondering if the writers might have been inspired by that a little bit, especially considering season one seemed a little bit all over the place at times in terms of the writing so maybe they were like hey that's kind of a cool plot element and we haven't totally finalized where we want the show to go yet so we'll add this in granted i have nothing to back that up other than the fact that there do seem to be a handful of parallels there but nonetheless it does seem to be the direction he's heading he needs to collect the powers of each of them unite them within himself to create this quote-unquote perfect ai now let's go back to the fact that bowman also states that if he loses 
then Playmaker gets him. Does that mean play that Bowman is going to switch sides? I mean, it certainly could make some sense in some ways. I said before, Lightning's a very by-the-books villain, right? And although Bowman's evolved a little bit past that, evolution normally builds on the traits one is already strong with, rather than outright developing a whole lot of new ones. So where does that mean in this situation? Well, let's take a look at Lightning, right? I keep saying he's by the numbers. So he would be objectively looking for who he believes to evolve best. Well, in a character like Bowman's eyes, that isn't somewhat emotionally driven and somewhat, you know, concerned about the continued existence of the AI and who wasn't around necessarily when Dr. Kogami was, you know, setting out with this huge objective to inspire the AIs to be able to succeed humanity. He may see, okay, playmakers beat me. I'm the next step in AI's evolution. Perhaps humanity still is the strongest form of life. What it seems to me that Bowman's quote unquote dedicated objective is to provide the most advanced form of life possible as the dominant form of life on the planet. So if that's the, if Yusaku manages to overcome him, it's very possible that what he meant by that is okay, I acknowledge humans are the most powerful form of life still. I'm going to side with you on this to make sure you continue to coexist and run as you will. That way Earth is under the most powerful beings quote unquote rule for its own safety and so let's go ahead and move on to where this episode really leaves us off in the show moving forward and that's that we're basically lined up with all three of our major factions now or I guess it's really four are more or less in the same area kind of on the same page as to where the central like zone for this conflict is going on right now and everything else you got to figure you have the Knights of Hanoi you have the AIs then you have Yusaku and uh, Soulburner in them. If you can even really consider them on a different side than Revolver at this point, because it's becoming pretty clear to me that Yusaku and Revolver and probably even Soul Technologies are all going to have to work together on some level in order to go against these AIs and ensure humanity's survival, especially if Playmaker comes to lose on this next duel. I think it would be a really interesting arc if we see Playmaker lose and then kind of go into this kind of Yusei-like state of state of um, frustration and such as he's trying to get himself back together and we watch everybody else kind of try to fight these battles for him and to varying degrees of success that would set up really well for a lot of our other characters to get some serious development and it would make Yusaku develop in ways that are separate from dueling which I think could be fantastic very much um, it would be very much reminiscent of when Yusei lost to Kiru and basically needed to get back on his feet and have the motivation he needed to keep going again I think that could be a great little story arc for them to explore but anyway back to what I was saying we have all of our major players now in the same pot especially now that Revolver's informed soul technologies of where everybody is so I think we're gonna have some great Great interactions coming up between them and we're gonna have a much better idea of where they stand and I think we're going to see some very fragile alliances formed particularly between like Seoul, the Knights of Hanoi and Yusaku in order to defend against what is probably the larger threat at play. Something somewhat similar to what we saw with Yuma and Shark teaming up to take on Don Thousand. They were theoretically on opposite sides of the conflict but both of their respective sides were much more um, threatened by Don Thousand, who was like against them both. So it goes back to the old, the enemy of my enemy is my friend type of thing. So I think that could be great to watch unfold and then kind of collapse back into the original factions from there. And I think that could parallel or gateway very well into eventually Soul Technologies probably being our final antagonists. They seem to be sort of setting up with a lot of shady dealings, so I could see that coming forth. So with all that being said, guys, I think we've had a fantastic couple of episodes laid out on the table before us. Be sure to let me know all of your thoughts, comments, Comments, theories, ideas in the comment section down below. And if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe. If not, constructive criticism is always welcome. And I'll catch you guys next time on some more Yu Gi Oh! Reigns discussion.